Hi, your fellow wall crawlers, and welcome to the sticky, mediocre web of the mediocre spider mat I know it's been a while since our last kind of uneventful adventure, but sometimes problems appear in my local neighborhood that are so big, so threatening, so multiverse spanning that I can't ignore my mat sense, which I sometimes do. I gotta take this threat head on, and sometimes that involves punching my weird anamorph robot dad, sacrificing my hot wife to Mephisto for no reason, and worst of all, playing Spider-Man 2 on the PC. So for today's episode, we'll be swinging into one of the most unique and imaginative titles in the Arachnite's video game career, 2010's Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions. Developed by Beanox Interactive and published by Alchemax for the 360, PS3, PC, Wii, and Nintendo DS. It is a game of firsts in a lot of ways, or at the very least, the first in a long times is. The last four mainline console Spider-Man games had all been open world, and by the end of Web of Shadows, the formula was growing a bit long in the tooth, aside from that game's uh, obvious charms. Dad! Oh God! Beanox was a very under-the-radar choice to shake things up in the world of radioactive spider games, as their previous two efforts were milquetoast adaptations of DreamWorks animated fluff that were, let's be honest, never as cool as Spider-Man. I'm very rich and famous. I'm 38 years old. I'm dating a 17-year-old. <laughs> But they must have impressed Alchemax enough to land the job, since the old webhead was still a hot enough property at this time, largely due to Treyarch's efforts on the PS2 and Xbox, and nothing to do with their efforts on the 360 or PS3. I'm going to die! For those with poor memory, Shattered Dimensions switched things up by going with a linear, level-based design, with you alternating between four different Spider-Men in four different universes, trying to piece together the immensely powerful tablet of order and chaos. You see, the Green Goblin, <laughs> no, Dr. Octopus, actually no, it was the Kingpin, it wasn't even him. In his only promotion into a main villain role, Jake Gyllenhaal attempts to steal said mystical ass tablet. Spidey appears and hilarity ensues. <laughs> nice! Don't get me wrong, your illusions are nifty, but if you ask me, they could use a little more kick. <laughs> nah, -uh. souvenirs are available in the gift shop. Stop it! The tablet is then shattered, eh, which causes all of its pieces to scatter throughout the multiverse. It's right here where everyone's favorite gilf, Madame Webb, tasks all the other Spider-Men with cleaning up the horrible reality-shredding mess. After a really fun tutorial sequence that flies through all four heroes, their powers, and pushes the narrative, we start the game proper with Peter Parker of The Amazing Variety. He's played expertly by Neil Patrick Harris, returning to the role after his turn in the mainframe produced CG MTV Spider-Man show called Spider-Man. If I were you, you know what would be my biggest fear? Gravity. Like most MTV cartoons of this time, it was cancelled for absolutely no reason. Anyway, levels in 616 will never surprise you too much, relying on plenty of Spidey tropes from both the comics and prior games, which isn't a bad thing. If Shattered Dimensions was all about him though, then yeah, the game would feel very safe. His focus is all about mobility, web swinging, and just webs in general. While all the Spider Boys share core combat mechanics, Amazing Man has awesome, almost comically oversized web hammers and the like, but sadly, no web boats. If we then turn back the clock to the 1930s, we will find Spider-Man Noir, who had only just debuted in print a year before, making for an already exciting addition to the game. His outdated slang is provided by Christopher Daniel Barnes, best known for providing milestones in voice acting. No! Chase you to the ends of the earth! That will stay with us forever. 
while it takes some time getting used to, Mr. Barnes really starts slipping into the persona as he navigates his high contrast black and white world, punching out palookas and poltroons alike. Gotta grab the shadows and make my play. Take these palookas down one by one. Out of all dimensions, Noir provides the biggest changeup in how the game actually plays, as it heavily leans towards stealth action, obviously inspired by the Arkhams. The lowliest bad guys are also armed to the teeth, each one having the potential to turn Noir into a block of Swiss cheese in mere seconds. Therefore, he needs to take them out as sneakily as possible with all manner of elaborate acrobatic insanity. Of course, the game will also sporadically give you straight up combat sections where you serve up Jack Johnson and Tom O'Leary sandwiches. Because, as everyone knows, Noir likes to do two things. I like to drink egg creams, and I like to fight Nazis. A lot. Next, we have my favorite slash not-so-favorite Spider-Man of the far-flung future. I was a massive mark for the 2099-verse, and still am, but there are a few things I wish had been uh, different here. Firstly, the least known voice of the bunch, Dan Gevilzen, from the short-lived 80s cartoon, or I guess cartoons if you count his amazing friends, is unfortunately horribly miscast as the normally cool-headed and arrogant Miguel O'Hara. Now, I do think if there was a cheesy 80s or even 60s Spider-Man dimension, he'd totally work there and it'd be a laugh riot. Dare you point at me? You, you were pointing first. Rude to point. You're being very rude. You're However, in the edgy trappings of Nueva York, it just feels wrong to me. That's me, ready to save the universe and looking good while doing it. 2099 focuses on vicious high-speed punch fights and careful utilization of Miguel's unique power. <laughs> He can accelerate himself through time, slowing down everything else and gaining an extreme advantage in combat. His dimension also features fun but brief freefall sections where you'll have to navigate through some high-speed scenarios. Lastly, 2099 does not care about your eyeballs, so it's gonna melt them with way too many shiny surfaces, lighting, and effects, cause it doesn't give a shock. Our last spider isn't amazing, spectacular, or future, but rather ultimate. He's a younger Peter Parker, and I think is performed brilliantly here by Josh Keaton, who, while having a very career, will always be my little ocelot. If you liked him in Spectacular Spider-Man, and you did, Now now boys, no pushing, no shoving, single file is the polite way to attack the hero. He continues that excellent work here. The black suit! What am I doing in the black suit? I, I hate this thing! Gameplay-wise, Ultimate is a weird one, as he's saddled with the black suit because of reasons. <laughs> with that reason being an attempt to make him feel unique, which he just barely does. In lieu of Amazing's webs, the symbiote tendrils come out to play, and there's a greater emphasis on crowd control in combat, with Spidey taking out dozens of enemies in seconds. His exclusive power number uh, 34 on the surprisingly large list of video games which use rage as a mechanic is his symbiote rage. Essentially a powered up mode that jacks up Peter into a goddamn killing machine. Not particularly creative, but fun to use regardless. Other than that, there's not much that changes up in ultimate levels. Ideally, I would have preferred Miles Morales or even Gwen Stacy as their powers are a bit more interesting until I remember that this game predates both of them. Oh, um, well what about, um, Agent Venom, Flash Thompson? Ah, son of a bitch! I think one of the main strengths to segregating the game in this way is that it let Beanox go crazy with ideas in regards to each dimension, although it only works optimally like 50% of the time. For Amazing Spider-Man, you'll start with a jungle temple for Craven, a mining town for Sandman, a downtown NYC construction site for Juggernaut, and so on. In the Ultimate Universe, Electro's assaulting a hydroelectric dam, and the Merc with the Mouth Deadpool has commandeered an oil rig swarming with enemies, an obvious homage to Face Off. As an aside, this was Nolan North's first time voicing Deadpool in a video game, and they make excellent use of him here. Hi, Ma, and welcome to Pain 
Factor, the only show where you compete for your life. And remember, viewers, I'm available for Black Ops missions, assassinations, and birthday parties. This oil rig is, of course, a front for his own wacky extreme game show, so the script basically writes itself. Is there a mute button for him? However, when it comes down to 2099 and noir, well, they fare a little worse in terms of environmental diversity. While there's certainly some attempt to balance between indoor and outdoor locations, they mostly wind up feeling visually repetitive, which you kind of have to chalk up to the art style. 2099 is especially guilty of this. Labs, offices, more labs, and more labs, it all kind of blends together. Thankfully, gameplay-wise, what you actually do in said levels is always changing up. Let's take uh, Cravens for example. Combat mixed with traversal at the start before wandering into the hunter's crosshairs in a cool little sniper sequence while fighting off waves of baddies. Soon after, you are locked into a cage match with Craven. Hey listen, it's some kind of mistake. I didn't sign up for a cage match. Complete with its own unique gimmicks, where you are then back to swinging and punching. This all culminates in the final showdown that plays quite differently than the last scrap you had with Mr. Kravenoff. All of the levels are smartly paced in this way, with villain chases, combat, freefall sections, item hunts, and rescue missions all peppered throughout, so you're never doing the same thing for too long. This, mixed together with the four different playable Spider-Men, is what keeps the game from ever getting repeated. Repetitive, but there is one other important way in how all this dimensional fabric is held together. The Web of Destiny is a really cool series of in-game challenges that are organized level by level. Every time you complete one, the adjacent ones unlock. This includes stuff you'll naturally accomplish, like beat a certain enemy, but also includes trickier things like destroying particular objects during a boss battle or finding all the golden spider collectibles. For every cluster of objectives you complete, you'll unlock more and more tiers of upgrades for your spider people. New moves, combos, or to increase your rage gauge. Finally, this is also how you unlock all your Spidey suits, which in a neat twist, more or less are themed to each Spidey. Any advanced tech suits like the goddamn motherfucking spider armor are attributed to 2099, as well as the Iron Spider. If you really dig deep into the closet, there's some pretty dope threads in there that Sony Interactive Spider-Man featuring the PS4 didn't even touch. This then really drives you to complete as many tasks as you can to earn all the suits and upgrades, and since it's a level-based affair, you can go back to any you've completed to fill out the web. I guess it's something to do with how the levels are designed around these tasks, but it's an addictive little metagame that's really fun to complete. Also, you don't need to do every single one to finish Shattered Dimensions. If you want some of the higher tier costumes though, well, you better start crawling through this tangled web. Getting upgrades is ideal, as it'll also make it easier to whoop the huge assortment of villains on display here. A different one always caps off each stage, and it's always exciting when you knock another one off your hit list and move on to the next. What's even cooler is seeing brand new takes on the classic baddies that were created just for this game. Dr. Octopus 2099, Hobgoblin 2099, and on top of them all, Hammerhead Noir, which is basically just Hammerhead. While the console versions are identical when it comes to the rogues gallery, the DS version plunges its fist deep into the obscurity hole, extracting some wonderfully unexpected picks. Boomerang, Tinkerer, Silvermane, and Calypso. Hmm, more Calypso please, and thank you. The villain lineup in general I think is pretty strong overall, featuring a mix of classics and new spins on said classics, and ones that haven't appeared in Spidey games before, and I honestly don't think there's a weak link among them. Except for... Now, I've gushed my little web spooters all over Spider-Man Dimensions so far, but it ain't flawless. Starting with the story, if you're looking for a narrative that's filled with twists and turns, emotional stakes, or anything outside of straightforward superheroine, you're not gonna get it here. 
It's very much a Saturday morning cartoon style Spider-Man tale that never takes itself all that seriously, which is especially hard to do when Mysterio is getting his hands on a mystical MacGuffin that causes him to become a giant. Fishbowl Face is simply a big bad at the end of a list of big bads because he's doing something more evil than the others. Each level feels like an isolated episode of a show or comic, but the stakes don't really rise as you play like, say, in other Spider-Man games. Oh god, please stop. Stop playing that dumb scene. This is a side effect where the importance and looming threat of Mysterio is never really the focus, so there's little tension going into the final battle. If you are looking for a fun, bouncy narrative where you punch some bad guys in the face and save the day, well, you'll be satisfied with the tale being told here. But if you are hankering for something with some emotional weight and drama, well, that's not really something Shattered Dimensions is concerned with. Aside from the fluffy story, some animation also feels a little off here and there. J just simple things. Walking, running, stealth takedowns, jumps, and the animation blending in between. None of it is even approaching bad, just maybe a tad unpolished. Again, perhaps I was used to the huge bounding leaps you'd see in the sandbox spideys, but going back to this game now, it's a little bit noticeable. The last thing to mention, which is honestly a minus, a particular aspect of the boss fights, and I'm sure those of you who are even the least bit familiar with SD know where I'm going with this. In most, but not every boss battle, the camera will pull in close and present it from a first person perspective, where you'll fight the villain punch out style, except it's not really fun at all. The problem here is that changing things up in this way isn't something you should attempt as a quick little minigame. If you're gonna do it, do it right. Use your whole ass. Make a full-on Spidey first-person melee fighter. What's here is just kinda clunky and awkward. Spidey's attacks don't feel very responsive or satisfying, and the wind-ups and tells of each villain are not especially well choreographed. I get how they wanted to show off each villain up close. They are modeled nicely and each one spouts some great lines, but I'm just glad these things never lasted too long. It was the first and last time we saw Spidey fisticuffing like this in a video game. Now, with all that unpleasantness out of the way, let's talk versions. Where do they all stack up? For this video, I played through the Steam port, and in terms of graphical fidelity, it can't be beat. High resolutions, perfect frame rate, all that stuff. I did, however, have it crash several times during the first 2099 level, and I couldn't really find a reliable fix for it. The game is 10 years old after all. The 360 version is the one I originally played back in 2010, and there's nothing I remember inherently wrong with it. And while I can't vouch personally for the PS3, I assume they're pretty much in parody with each other. Probably the most impressive, though, is the Wii version, which scaled down incredibly well when compared to the others. The exact same levels, villains, and all the cutscenes are present. It's just not in HD. I remember booting this up and being stunned with how good it looked. Probably one of the best port downs I've ever seen. Of course, I gotta mention the DS version again. It's a neat little search action game that puts you in maze-like levels you navigate with a map, with each new power letting you access new areas. Many DS Spider-Man titles did this, with almost all of them coming from Gryptonite Games, who also dipped into other Marvel superheroes as well. Now, it does cut out the Ultimate Universe from the roster, but in exchange, you do get Calypso, so it all kind of shakes out. Unfortunately, due to the nature of the Spider-Man IP and him apparently being used as a Sony bargaining chip, none of these games are available digitally, of course. I just so happen to be fortunate enough to download it off Steam before it was removed. If you're interested in snagging a copy, well, better get physical. Now, the marketing campaign leading up to launch was nothing short of brilliant. Much like a fighting game at each subsequent con or media event, a new Spider-Man would get revealed for the lineup, leading to a certain level of anticipation. Thankfully, while there were pre-order incentives that were split up between brick and mortar stores, it simply gave you a costume unlock right out of the gate. You could still earn everything in-game. Shattered Dimensions sold so well that Activision then contacted 
contracted Beanox to handle the next three games in the series, although sadly, none of them would reach the heights that Shattered Dimensions soared to. Maybe we'll get around to some of those in a future episode. What's far more important is the ripple effect Shattered Dimensions had throughout the entire Spider-Verse. While the one-off episode of the Fox Kids cartoon was the first to play with the subject matter, it was Dan Slott's work on the story treatment of Shattered Dimensions which inspired him to build on the concept which led to the comic book events, which of course led into the Spider-Verse. It all really started here. That makes Shattered Dimensions one of the most important Spider-Man video games um, ever! Right alongside Spider-Man 2 and, of course, the PC point-and-click. The last four radioactive spider games have all been open world, and the one after that will most likely be as well. So while I don't think it would be any time soon, eventually we will see something like Shadow Dimensions once again. The character is just too unique to chain down to one particular style. Oof, oof with, with the popularity of the Spider-Verse right now, we could get Miles, Gwen, Peter Porker, Kane, Spider-Side? That's a terrible idea. Jesus. Don't ever let me direct a Spider-Man game. And that's another episode of the mediocre Spider-Man in the spider bag. Ugh. Anyway, Shadow Dimensions gets a big old one for JJ recommendation from me. If you want to suggest another game in the wall crawler's long career, hit me up in the comments below or swing on over to the offices of the Daily Bu- I mean the Flophouse VIP Patreon to send me pics of your Spider-Man games. If we can get a picture of Julia Roberts in a thong, we can certainly get a picture of this weirdo. Yeah.